a soybean educator with Michigan State University Extension, and I want to welcome you to this virtual soybean field day. The reason we're doing the field day is to give our specialists an opportunity to share their uh, timely and relevant research projects that they're doing across the state, share some management practices that'll help soybean producers be more profitable, and uh, just to give producers, any participants that are joining us, a chance to ask questions. Uh, we've built that into the program. Having said that, the question, the best way to answer, ask your questions is in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box. So please type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will be checking those periodically. The way we're going to handle questions is we'll probably entertain one or two questions at the end of each presentation and uh, to make a smooth transition in between our presenters. And then after that, we will jump right into um, the presentation, the next presentation. The rest of the questions will be answered at the end. We've saved approximately a half hour for open time for question and answer. So be thinking of your questions. Uh, we've got some excellent experts with us today. The next thing I wanna talk about is that we do have two credits available for today's session, two pesticide recertification credits. And to get those credits, the best way to do that, really the only way to do that, is to fill out the survey at the end of the session. Once you fill out the survey, you will have the seminar, seminar code sent to you, and uh, you'll be able, to, uh, be able to register that way uh, for your credits. So it's very critical for you to get your credits to fill out the survey, but for us to get the information that we need to improve our educational efforts. So we sure appreciate that. Um, the only last thing I wanna say is that the reason we're doing this virtually, and it probably needs to go unsaid, but is because of COVID-19. We really want to preserve um, human health and, and safety, and so we appreciate your willingness to join us virtually for this field day. We have a really, it takes a group to make things like this happen, and one of our best partners in the state of Michigan is the Michigan Soybean Promotion Committee. They're just a tremendous uh, uh, partner, important and valued partner. And uh, just for an example, they fund half of my position to do education in, around soybeans uh, across the state of Michigan. They fund much of our research. And many of the topics that are talked about today uh, will, will probably have been funded by your Michigan Soybean Promotion Committee. So we want to introduce uh, Jana Fritz, the Executive Director, uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. And as Mike said, we're uh, very unhappy that we, you know, have to be virtual, but, but we miss all of you farmers, soybean farmers, and wish we could be together in the field, but want to maintain that level of human health. Um, Mike's already done a great job of introducing our organization. The Michigan Soybean Promotion Committee is, you know, more casually known as the Soybean Checkoff and a major component of our work uh, is production research. Um, with that research, we also focus on outreach and market development activities. Those are our three main areas of focus, um, but specifically speaking about some of the research you'll see today, uh, almost half of our annual budget is dedicated toward partnerships with MSU, other research partners, uh, extension, and, and overall our on-farm trials as well, which might Mike works with, where we work with uh, farmer cooperators to do some uh, real life trials on individual farms in a, in a true um, home based kind of situation. So we try very hard at the Soybean Promotion Committee to provide all the soybean farmers with uh, the resources needed um, to have a healthy crop and uh, to help market their businesses and continue to grow the soybean industry. So again, Mike, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm so happy to be with you today. And uh, best of luck to all the researchers in this in this virtual field day. If there's any ever any questions for the Soybean Promotion Committee, feel free to reach out to us, either social media, our website, or our office number. So thank you again. Jana, thank you. We really do appreciate all the support that the checkoff provides to our researchers and our educational activities. Thank you very much. Um, are any questions for Jana? If I don't see any in the, in the box, but if you do have some, please uh, do type them in the, the Q&A box. All right, uh, with that, we're gonna introduce our, our first presenter is uh, Dr. Manny Singh and a graduate student, uh, Tom Seiler. Manny is our, our production systems agronomist at Michigan State University Extension. 
Hello everybody, uh, my name is Manny Singh. I'm the cropping systems agronomist here at Michigan State University. Uh, the program uh, that we are running here focus on identifying agronomic management practices that we can use to maximize productivity and profitability of uh, various row crops that we grow in Michigan, focusing mainly on corn, soybean, and small grains. Today we are out here looking at some of the work that we are doing in soybean production, specifically focusing on how we can change management practices based on when we are able to plant our soybean crops. We have been dealing with these variable climate situations uh, that's leading to variability in our planting window. So we are essentially looking at, based on when we are able to plant, do we need to change our management? And some of those management decisions are easy to change and can be planned ahead of time. Others might not be that, that easy. So we are looking at all those gamuts of uh, management decisions, starting with variety selection, row spacing, seeding rates, use of seed treatments, in-season fertility, uh, all those practices to see how we can optimize those based on when we are able to plant. Uh, this is uh, our third year of this research, and uh, I have my graduate student, uh, Tom Seiler, who's leading this work uh, here, and he will talk more about what we are seeing uh, here in the, in, in the field. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Seiler. I'm a second year graduate student in Dr. Meninder Singh's lab. And as he mentioned, we're looking at optimizing agronomic decisions based on planting date. Um, ideally, soybean planting would occur er as early in the season as possible. However, conditions such as unfavorable weather, um, poor soil conditions, equipment availability, and farm size often result in delayed planting situations. So therefore, in Michigan, we're experiencing planting dates as early as April and as late as um, early July even. So one of the benefits to early planting is the, the earlier canopy closure. So as we can see here, these, pla these uh, soybean plants were planted on May, May 13th. And we can see that they have already achieved full canopy closure. We can see that they are suppressing weeds very well, shading the weeds so they're not receiving light. And we're also in reproductive growth already. We are already seeing pods on these plants. And we can compare the early planted soybeans over to soybeans that are planted later. So these soybeans were planted on June 12th. And we can see the vast difference between this canopy and the previous plots canopy. These plants are not shading weeds, they're not maximizing light interception, and they're still in vegetative growth. There's no reproductive growth occurring here. Another factor that's affecting your canopy closure will be your row spacing. So we can come back to this early planted. These were planted on 15 inch row spacings, and we have that full canopy closure. And we can come here and compare that to what's on 30 inch row spacings. So these are planted on the same day, but we can see that maximum light interception is not being achieved. There's still areas between the rows that, are, that have gaps. So we're seeing a little bit of weed pressure there, and um, we're not maximizing moisture in this plot. So these plants were planted in early June, and we can see that there is a a pretty good canopy closure. However, they are behind in reproductive growth. We can see that these are at early bloom, maybe late bloom, but they are, they're still far behind the early planted soybeans and full maximum or full canopy closure is not achieved yet. We can also see that achieving an optimal plant stand is critical to maximizing canopy closure. These soybeans were planted early in the season at a low seeding rate. Shortly after planting, we had a heavy rainfall and a crust formed on the soil surface. This resulted in a low plant stand with many gaps where soybeans did not emerge, which led to a non-uniform canopy. And within there, we can see weed issues, especially mare's tail, where they're not being shaded by the soybean canopy. We can see difference in the canopy closure between these early planted soybeans and the soybeans that are planted later. We can see the difference in canopy closure between the, the early planted soybeans and these soybeans that were planted later in early June. These did not have reduced emergence due to soil crusting, and the canopy here is much more uniform in achieving greater light interception and weed shading. The overall goal of this study is to optimize 
canopy closure by identifying the ideal row spacing and seeding rate during early season uh, soybean planting and determine if those recommendations should be adjusted as planting is delayed. During the soybean field day, we'll also be discussing the results from previous year's research, which include other management decisions um, that can be adjusted based on planting date, such as optimal maturity group selection, seeding rate, and seed treatment. Manny, you are muted if you would like to unmute your microphone. All right. How about now? Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, yeah, thanks. So again, uh, I thought I'll start with uh, how our 2020 planting season compared to the, the years before, right? Here you can see by the end of May, we were almost 60% planted. And that was way ahead of even our five year average and much ahead of uh, what, what we were able to do in 2019, right? So this kind of shows the, the variability in planting window that we have been observing over the last few years. And that goes back to what we were discussing in the video that we might need to be thinking about how we change our management based on when we are able to plant with the goal of that early season canopy development, right? So we are closing canopy early in the, in the season and able to maximize light interception. Uh, and essentially coming back to this approach that based on these planting times, early, mid or late season, we're dealing with different planting conditions, right? Uh, early in the season, we can benefit from this longer growing season, but we have these non-ideal planting conditions. How, how do we deal with that and benefit from this longer growing season, right? Compared to when we are delayed, we're dealing with a shorter growing season. So how we can maximize our canopy development once we are at, at that point. Uh, we did do some on-farm trials in 2019. We were part of this uh, seven or eight Midwestern states, uh, essentially looking at some of this on-farm management practices based on some of the survey, docu survey data that, that we collected, including uh, farmers here in, in Michigan. We had about 10 or so fields uh, from Michigan in, in this uh, survey. So in this figure, you can see the reference yield is the yield from mid to late planting date, uh, mid to late May planting times. On the y-axis, uh, it's a yield from the improved, which was for the most part early planting, but there were some other caveats in there, use of low seeding rate, along with the fungicide application in subset of plots. So there, those are some confounding factors here. But if you can see at this red line, that's a one-to-one -one line. And most of the fields were above that line. Overall, there was about a five bushel increase in yield by planting early along with some of these other management practices. And we have about 15 fields in Michigan this year where we'll, we'll be evaluating again and separating this early planting from other management that, that, that we had confounded here. Even when we looked at the economics, we did see about a $50 per acre increase uh, by going with this early planting along with this few other management. So this is showing a potential of early planting in terms of increased yield. And we are also interested as, as we said in the video is, do we need to change management based on, 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 the, on the planting time, right? Variety selection and seeding rate. Uh, we have a lot of data uh, already on, on, on those aspects uh, and, and I'll, I'll share some, but we have a lot of that available if, if there is more interest there. And this year we are looking into more practices, uh, row spacing, use of inoculation, fertility. So what other uh, practices we can do to maximize our canopy development and yield potential without putting too much input cost on, on top of things. Uh, quick snippet on, uh, on, the, uh, on the variety selection. Uh, this is the figure that MSC Extension puts out in terms of the optimal maturity groups in, in the state based on where, where you are. Using the, the Lansing area as an example, which has this 2.5 maturity group as the optimal, right? Uh, this is a figure from a two-year uh, trial. 
Uh, I have planting dates on x-axis and the maturity groups on, on y-axis and different color represents different yield uh, levels here. So if we look at the 2.5, you can see if we were planting in the early May period, as we go from short uh, or early to this long majority group, we are seeing a three to five bushel benefit there, as you can see in this different colors. When we are in this mid planting window, we did see little bit, but not a whole lot of yield benefit there. With this delayed June planting, we did not see any benefit. And there was actually an increase in moisture on the harvested beans uh, with the long majority group. So you can see this uh, interaction uh, playing out uh, uh, between majority group and our planting dates. Same thing uh, we noticed in the, in the seeding rate uh, side of things, a lot of data here. I have my soybean yield on y-axis and the final plant stand on x-axis. So you need to account for about 20 to 25% uh, extra to convert that into a, a seeding rate number. You can see I have four figures here. So that shows uh, four different planting times. And we did see again an interaction between seeding rate and when we are planting. Essentially driven by this late June planting when we had to increase our seeding rates to benefit. Otherwise we did not benefit much by increasing seeding rate. These two lines on all of these figures point to the 95% yield level and 99% yield level. And one point I want to make here is that you can see how many extra plants we need to go from that 95 to 99% yield level along in all of those planting date scenarios, right? And you can also see the variability that we are seeing in our, our data, meaning that yes, yeah, some of these decisions are specific to a given site and given year's weather condition. So if we put the economics on, on top of this, this starts represent the, the final plant stand where we were achieving 99% economic returns accounting for the seed cost. You can see those numbers are actually close to our 95% yield potential. So again, showing a potential to cut down our seeding rates uh, based on our unique field situations here. So uh, in terms of our ongoing work, uh, as we talked in the video, we are looking at this uh, row spacing by seeding rate interaction and trying to update our recommendations that do we need to change our seeding rate based on the row spacing we are using. We are doing more work at the variety uh, selection using more maturity groups early and late in the, in, in the planting season. So we'll have more data on that aspect as well as looking at the inoculation uh, side of things. Fertility, we were unable to do much this year because of COVID, but we are looking forward to do more work uh, hopefully next year. So again, I think coming back to this, uh, managing uh, or changing our decisions based on planting time. Here I have listed few of them, right? Again, dividing season into this early, mid and late uh, windows, and then looking at some of these uh, aspects I have written in green, where we have data that is showing benefit of using and changing these practices, using these late majority varieties early, then going to mid and then to early varieties as, as the season progress. Lower seeding rate uh, early and then uh, changing it to a higher later in, in the season. Uh, the ones in red, we are still looking at, at those aspects and hopefully we'll have some data that, that we'll share in our winter extension meetings. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for listening and uh, our information is here if you guys want to go and check more of it. Do we have time for questions, Mike? We do, we have time for a question. I don't see any in the question and answer box. So this is just a reminder uh, the best way to get your questions answered is to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Manny, I've got a question since we don't have one from the group. Um, we've had some really wet falls in the past and the uh, last two years have been very difficult. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we could be doing at planting time or what are some of the top things we can be doing at planting time to maybe take some of the harvest risk out of raising soybeans? So yeah, that, that, that's a good, good question, Mike. One thing we have been thinking about again is this maturity selection idea, right? I, I did show a benefit that we recommend maturity groups based on 
they are optimal zones, but there is an interaction with planting time, right? So we, we need to be careful about what maturities we are using and then they are able to mature in time. So if we are dealing with, again, a variable harvest window as well, that we have like sort of this portfolio approach, I, I would say that we need to stack, uh, have an idea about what fields we can plant early or late based on, again, uh, their soil texture and their, their location, right? And sort of think about that. Can we use this portfolio approach? So we are stacking our harvesting window, right? And then another important aspect we are finding out is that if we are looking into the potential of cutting down on, on the seeding rate, we really need to be careful about our combine settings because with these lower plant stands, we are seeing that the, the, the lowest pod height is closer to, to the ground. And these uh, stems are pretty thick. They're really bushy plants. So we need to make sure that cutter bar height is low enough that we are not we are not uh, leaving yield out in the, in, in the field. So planning ahead of time, keeping those aspects in mind, I think is, is, is critical uh, to, to manage our, our harvest window. Thank you, Manny. We have time for one more question. There's one that showed up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the chat box or the question and answer box. Um, you're, this is from Mark. Your graph showed all planting dates had max yield at population less than 100,000. Am I reading that correctly? Yes. Okay. So, so yeah, we, so we have a lot of data again uh, on, on that aspect. And I just showed one graph there. Again, I think we have different. So we are even trying to separate the yield from the economics of it, right? And we have actual numbers at, at what final plant density and at what seeding rate we are able to get to that 99% or 95% yield levels. And we'll put out those actual numbers on our, on our website. So, so you guys can go and, and look that out. But on an average, what we are finding out is that, that we, the, the, the number that university extensions have been throwing out, that 100,000 number that we might be able to even cut that number uh, to, to optimize our, our yields and more importantly, our economics. Very good, very good. We do have some other questions in there, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask you to uh, hold these questions until, keep typing your questions in the Q&A box and we will address those approximately at 9.30 this morning. So I would like to keep the program rolling and, and uh, introduce our next presenters. Um, next on the program is Dr. Christy Sprague and Justine Fisher, and uh, they're going to give us a herbicide or weed control update. Well, good morning. Today is July 15th, and we're out at one of our soybean plots that's uh, funded by the Michigan Soybean Promotion Committee. Uh, today we're going to be talking and looking at some of our plots that are looking at mare's tail control or horseweed control. Um, horseweed's been a huge issue over the last several years, mainly because it is resistant to glyphosate and to a lot of other herbicides. So we've been looking at some different technologies, and we've really been trying to integrate some different strategies. And over the last couple of years, I had a grad student, uh, John Shromsky, who was looking at um, using cereal rye and winter wheat as a cover crop to help suppress horse wheat early in the season. And we had some really good results from that research where we're looking at planting green and um, also controlling or using those cover crops early to suppress horse weed. Um, today, we're gonna look at a project that is Justine Fisher. She's a new master's student who is gonna kind of take John's work a step further and then also include um, the use of soybean, soybean row wits. Um, looking at different row widths to see if that can also help suppress horse weed because we're looking at all sorts of management strategies to try to get that weed under control. Hi everyone, my name is Justin Fisher and as Christy mentioned, I am a first year graduate student in the MSU Weed Science Program. In previous years, the program has looked at controlling horse weed in no-till soybean by incorporating different cover crop covers such as pseudo rye and winter wheat. However, this year we wanted to take it a step further and look at the combination of a cereal rye cover as well as three different row widths. These three different row widths are seven and a half, 15 and 30 inch beans. And for the seven and a half inch beans, we used a 1560 no-till John Deere planter, whereas the 15 and 30 inch rows were planted with an 
Max Emerge XP heavy frame planter. We wanted to look at the addition of a cereal rye cover crop, and in doing this, we wanted to look at what it looks like when we terminate the cereal rye a week before planting and a week after planting, as well as comparing to a no cover. So today we are gonna look at the different row spacings, a cover crop termination, and what the effects are on horse wheat emergence in no-till soybean. So looking here, we have the 30 inch row spacing, and this is the no cover. Another thing we looked at, in addition to the row spacings, as well as the incorporation of cereal rye as a cover, we wanted to look at options of post treatments a couple weeks after planting. As you can see here, we have the 30 inch row spacing and the population for this was 150,000 seeds per acre. In this treatment, we used an application of Roundup as a post treatment around a couple weeks after planting. However, these are glyphosate resistant horseweed and so we can see that there's not going to be as good of control as what we see with our other post option we used. Here we have the 15 inch rows and as you can see compared to the 30 inch rows there is less horseweed and less horseweed above the canopy. So this is something to look at with these different row spacings is the potential to decrease horseweed emergence but also maybe possibly decrease the height of the horseweed. And this is also the no cover and with the same application of glyphosate at the 32 ounces per acre as a post. And then next we're gonna move into the seven and a half inch drilled beans. Now here we have our narrowest row spacing, the seven and a half inch. And as you can see here again, there's definitely more canopy closure. And this is showing that horseweed is being suppressed in germination as well as the heights. In addition to looking at different row widths, we also wanted to look at incorporating a cereal rye cover. In this case, we looked at terminating the cereal rye a week before planting with glyphosate. And this option did not receive the post of the Liberty and Enlist one. So here we are gonna see horseweed emergence. However, compared to the no cover, you can see a big decrease in horseweed emergence as well as height. So this is something to look at with the incorporation of the cover and how much it can help to decrease horseweed pressure in your fields. Here we have the early burn down application in combination with the seven and a half inch drilled beans. And as we can see here, the cover is helping to decrease horseweed germination, but also by having the narrow row widths, we're also seeing a decrease in horseweed emergence. So as Justine pointed out, we looked at uh, the no cover with the different row widths as well as the uh, early burn down. The other thing that we've been looking at more recently is these planting green, so basically terminating after soybeans have pl been planted. Uh, this year with some of the rain that we had, we got uh, planting a little bit later. So the cereal rye actually was um, uh, pretty much at full flower when we terminated it and it terminated very well with glyphosate. So one application did a really good job. What we do see is that um, with these planting green, we do see a lot of suppression of the horseweed. So that has worked well. The other thing that we're seeing this year, because we were really dry after planting soybeans, the soybeans are quite a bit further behind than our other, uh, either the early termination of the cereal rye or our no cover. So um, it'll be interesting to see how our yields turn out at the end of the season. We're continuing to look at uh, horseweed suppression, uh, definitely seeing quite a bit more suppression in these uh, um, planting green plots versus some of the others, but the, the early termination worked really well this year also. So um, this is kind of what we have going on. Um, in addition to this project, Justine's also looking at this in uh, winter wheat. So we're kind of looking at what effects some of these different covers have. And then we've got a couple other studies where we're looking at incorporating or using some residual herbicides pre-emergence, as well as um, kind of seeing uh, some different control strategies um, with post-emergence applications of different herbicides to manage uh, glyphosate resistant horseweed. We'll be presenting this information throughout the winter and also on our website, msuweeds.com. So um, those are some of the things that we've been doing over the last couple of years is really looking at how to manage um, horseweed or mares tail. And we've got several other studies that are looking at that. 
One of the other um, weeds that we've really focused a lot of work on is uh, with water hemp. And just to make a few comments about that, we've had studies over the last several years looking at different uh, soybean technologies. And some of those technologies have um, been the um, Enlist uh, soybeans, also the Extend soybeans, as well as looking at Liberty Link, Roundup Ready systems, all the different systems. So we've got some good information that we'll be able to share with you um, throughout the winter. Um, all of our recommendations can be found in our weed control guide. So we'll be updating the um, weed control guides uh, for the 2021. Those will be available in December, as well as several of the um, other uh, uh, fact sheets that we will put on our, our, our um, website, msuweeds.com. So I don't know if we have any questions, Mike. Yes, Christy, we do. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of them. Uh, first one is, what's the best herbicide program for water hemp? Is, uh, is that system also going to control mare's tail? That's a really good question. So we've really tried to focus on um, making sure that growers go out there with a pre-emergence herbicide. And what I would say is that when we look at the options that we do have, we find that with water hemp, we have very good control with what we call our group 14 pre-emergence herbicides. So those are things like Valor and some of the different authority premixes that are out there. Um, in addition, um, we do, we can have some good control pre-emergence from some of our group 15 herbicides, which would be things like uh, dual uh, warrant outlook. Some of those can give us also some good pre-emergent starts. But what we really need to focus on for water hemp control is to make sure that we have a good post-emergence herbicide that can be used. And in the Enlist soybeans, that option gives us the ability to use Liberty or glufosinate. Plus, um, it also gives us the option to use Enlist 1, which is 2,4-D. Um, we have done some work where we've looked at the combinations of those, and those have worked well, or one or the other by itself. The key thing for water hunt control is really to get a pre-emergence herbicide down, because if not, you're really relying on that post-emergence application to try to control um, all of the water hemp that's out there. And in many cases, when we have water hemp, it's a huge uh, population. With mare's tail, um, that same system can work, but what we see really helps is if you can include some metribuzin in that pre-emergence herbicide. And over the last several years, we've done a lot of work looking at the effect of metribuzin rate on uh, soybean injury and yield. And we've had some very good uh, results with that in that we're seeing that um, we have some pretty good crop safety with some of the newer varieties um, with some little bit higher rates that gives us a little bit more mare's tail control. So those are some of the options that we have. Um, with some of the questions with the extend system, we'll have to see where that goes. But we do see that we can get some good residual control from pre-emergence applications of uh, some of the dicamba products that can be used in enlist soy or extend soybeans, excuse me. So the dicamba resistant soybeans. Um, and we'll be looking at probably in the next year or so the extend flex soybeans, which also gives us the option of using glufosinate or Liberty post-emergence. Um, again, we also have the LLGT 27s, which gives us the option to use glyphosate and Liberty, so that Liberty application. But with all these different programs, it's very important to start out with a pre-emergence herbicide that'll give us good, good initial control of either water hemp or uh, mare's tail. And if you're dealing with both, really what I'd like to see is a combination of metribuzin plus one of those group 14 herbicides. Excellent, Christy. There's kind of a follow-up question to that is uh, with the same strategies that you laid out or do we need to do something different with early planted soybeans? Beans planted in maybe perhaps the 20th of April or something like that. That's a really good question because we get that question a lot as far as looking at, you know, what, how does that pre-emergence herbicide hold out um, or how long does it extend? Usually a lot of times we're thinking with a pre-emergence herbicide, we're looking probably around four to, four to five, six weeks of uh, residual control. Um, with early planted soybeans, 
Uh, generally, we're not going to see water hemp coming up until about that second or third week of May. So those soybeans are going to get quite a big jump on things like water hemp that are going to come up. And some of that canopy is going to be very important to help suppress some of those weeds, particularly like what we're seeing with the mare's tail. The one thing we want to make sure that we do is we can get that post-emergence application on before that uh, soybean canopy happens. Um, but um, some of the concerns obviously are with the pre-emergence injury because a lot of times we're cooler and wetter and that's generally when we see more injury. But I think it's still very important to get um, a good soil applied product out there. Good, thank you very much, Christy. There are some other questions and, and if you have further weed control questions, please continue to enter them in the, in the Q&A box and we will address those at approximately 9.30. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our next presenter uh, this is going to be Dr. Martin Chilvers and Austin McCoy and Viviana Ortiz from the Pathology Lab at MSU. Apologies. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, so we've got a couple of graduate students with me this morning, and we'll be running a couple, through a couple of videos and talking about a couple of different diseases that we're we're currently studying, um, but we'd be happy to take any uh, questions that you guys have. That. Okay, so it sounds like you can't hear that video. Um, so let me try that again. Sorry about this, guys. Uh, if something looks like it's wrong too, Mike and Shelby, please speak up. You're right, Marty. We were not able to hear the hear the video. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm gonna just run that again, I guess. Uh, All right. Please. Sorry, folks. Okay, I'll try that again. Hi, I'm Vivian Ortiz and I am a PhD student at the MSU Field Crops Pathology Lab. And today I'm going to talk about charcoal rot. Charcoal rot is caused by the fungal pathogen Macrofumina phaseolina. This fungus survives in the soil and soybean recently as microsclerotia. Microsclerotia are actually tiny, dark structures that can overwinter in the soil. Then soybeans get infected when the roots come into contact with the fungus. This fungal growth inside the plants will clog the vascular system and it will cause wilting and it will cause also to prematurely die. Charcoal rot has traditionally been an issue in southern soybean production. However, it has become an increasing problem in northern soybean production as well. In our lab, we sequence in phenotype macrofumina isolates. Macrofumina isolates were sequenced to investigate if there is a difference between the genomes of isolates collected in the southern U.S. versus isolates collected in the northern U.S. We want to see why this difference might be occurring and we also phenotype isolate for fungicide sensitivity and for growth at different temperatures to examine if isolates may be adapted to northern or southern locations. Ultimately, we want to use this information to assist with management tactics such as breeding for resistance and use of fungicide seed treatments. With that, I mean, that's one of the projects we've got going on and that was really um, spurred by um, some drought conditions we had in 2012 and a lot more charcoal rot than normal. So that sort of uh, initiated some funding from the United Soybean Board and, and Michigan Soy was also part of that effort. Um, Vivi, would you like to just comment on charcoal rot management? Yes. 
Hi everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about charcoal road management. And since charcoal road is a disease that whose outbreaks are associated with drought, so most of the management practices are related to cultural practices. So the use of varieties with partial resistance. Also, we have rotation with known host crops such as wheat. Rotation with corn may be not so helpful because it, may, it is also a host. Mm, not all systems because this also is related with soil moisture. So we, uh, all the tactics are aimed to keep the moisture in the soil and avoid, for example, also high seeding rates for the same reason. Seed treatments have not been very effective. And um, we have been doing some experiments in the lab to test some fungicides and see how they behave in the lab. We have seen some effectiveness in reducing the fungal growth, or this needs to be tested in the field, right? And there is also not much information on color crops. So. If you wanna. Thanks, Vivi. Yeah, I mean, I just put the cover crops in there with a question mark. So, obviously, charcoal has a pretty broad host range. Um, presumably, though, you know, cover crops and diversifying rotation will help help with that management as well. But we definitely need a lot more data on uh, effects of cover crops in general on on diseases uh, of soybean and other field crops. Thank you, Vivi. All right. So I've got another student um, up next, um, Austin. The and he's been working on Phytophthora root right, uh, both Phytophthora soja and a newer disease uh, or a newer species of Phytophthora, Phytophthora sansomiana. So Austin, um, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Marty. <clears throat> um, so today I'll be talking uh, a bit about our most recent Phytophthora pathotype survey in Michigan, focusing on Phytophthora soja, our typical Phytophthora that causes stem and root rot in soybeans. Um, so the main goals of this project were to determine what our effective resistance genes are currently to Phytophthora soja for our best management strategies, but then also determining if there's any sort of uh, fungicide resistance building to um, three of our common uh, omycete seed treatments, methanoxam, which is the active in products such as apron, uh, ethoboxam, which is the active in uh, intigo, oxithiopiprolin, which is uh, lumicina seed treatment and then a general all-around fungicide uh, seed treatment that, that's common, uh, pyraclostrobin. All right. So that kind of leads into our three big management strategies for Phytophthora in general. Uh, genetic resistance is our best management strategy for, uh, for, uh, protects the plants year-round or throughout the growing season. Um, and this can either be through uh, single gene resistance, such as RPS genes, which you're likely to see in your seed, uh, seed catalogs. This can also be partial resistance, which might be called field tolerance in your catalogs. Um, but uh, RPS gene resistance is uh, really effective against single pathotypes or single strains of Phytophthora. Uh, whereas partial resistance is more effective against all strains of Phytophthora soja, um, but isn't as complete a resistance as uh, the single gene might be. Um, again, seed treatments are really important to protect stand early on, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, and the three big seed treatments that, that we use for uh, organisms like Phytophthora and Pythium uh, would be Methanoxam, Ethoboxam, and uh, the new product, Oxithiopiprolin. Um, I won't be touching too much on cultural practices today, uh, but obviously anything that will increase uh, poorly drained areas is likely to help uh, reduce incidence of Phytophthora disease. Um, and on the right, you can see a, a small spore in the middle of a plant root section, um, which is phy uh, Phytophthora oospore. Whoops, you can go back one, yeah. Um, so determining effective resistance genes uh, is pretty time consuming. We do so by uh, uh, inoculating small soybean plants with uh, uh, 
by Toppler isolates, each of those soybean plants will con contain a single resistance gene. So from there we can see is this uh, resistance gene effective or not at managing the, uh, this particular isolate by Toppler SOJ. Um, so keep in mind, we, we took samples from across the state and subjected them to pathotyping. So we have 80 or so isolates from across Michigan. And what we observed was um, we found three resistance genes that were effective, uh, the 3A resistance gene, the 3C, and uh, the 4. Um, unfortunately, only the 3A, which is effective, is found um, in some of our Michigan varieties. Um, these red outlined uh, resistance genes are the three that are most commonly available in Michigan. Uh, and the three highlighted genes are the three that were found to be effective in Mis Michigan. So we do have a breakdown of these resistance genes, uh, particularly of the 1C and the 1K, um, don't appear to be uh, really effective anymore in Michigan. Um, Marty, this might be a good point for the, uh, the video. Yeah, let's show that. So this is a video of Austin talking about the other uh, Phytophthora species, Phytophthora sans in the Anna. Unlike Phytophthora soje, another Phytophthora species that causes disease on soybeans, uh, Phytophthora sansomiana cannot be managed with resistance genes as we haven't identified any resistance genes yet. This trial hopes to change that. Here we have a susceptible inoculated plot and you can see that there are absolutely no plants showing, just showing exactly how susceptible these varieties are to the pathogen. Unlike the previous plot, which was susceptible, inoculated, and had no plants emerging from the ground, this plot is planted with a resistant variety, also inoculated, and you can see that the stand, while patchy, will likely recover to some extent and still yield. All right. So I mean, that's just a quick clip of what we've got going on at the uh, plant pathology farm there to look at screening for uh, resistance to uh, Phytophthora sansomiana, and we do that for other, other diseases too. So that kind of brings us to our last management strategy that I'm going to touch on, uh, which is fungicide seed treatments. So these plots, although they look kind of weird, um, they are showing that so far we haven't observed any resistance. Um, what these plots are showing is the estimated concentration of the fungicide that it takes to inhibit pathogen growth by 50%. Um, and what we're seeing is most things are at a PPM of uh, 0.1 or below, which is, I would consider, still very effective. Um, uh, we're not observing really any insensitive isolates thus far uh, with this testing. We still have a couple more isolates to test, but I'm not expecting there to be any breakdown of, of resistance and seed treatments, at least with Phytophthora SOJ. Um, so yeah, I just point, point out that this is really important information too, because there is, has been some talk about uh, Phytophthora SOJ being resistant to methanoxam, and we just haven't seen any evidence of that yet. Um, the higher the dot here is on the chart, the more um, insensitive it is to the fungicide, but we don't see any dots that are high enough that we'd really consider them to be resistant. Last video, Austin. Sorry. Cue up your last video. The last video. Screen to start with. Phytophthora sansomiana is an emerging pathogen of corn and soybean. And today we're going to look at a fungicide seed treatment trial, looking at efficacious and non-efficacious seed treatments to manage Phytophthora sansomiana. This first plot here is uh, treated with uh, fungicide compounds such as metalaxyl and ethoboxam, which are efficacious against Phytophthora, whereas the other two plots uh, to the right are treated with a general fungicide and insecticide or no treatment at all, neither of which are effective for managing Phytophthora diseases of soybean. How are we doing on time, Mike? We've, we've got another couple minutes. Okay, well, uh, let me just show you something quickly on um, soybean sudden death syndrome. 
Um, we do a lot of screening for different management tactics and we use this location um, down at Decatur, Michigan. And uh, I'll show you some video from that right now. So we're here today at our soybean sudden death syndrome screening location and soybean cyst nematode. Uh, so this location allows us to look at both of these diseases um, under pretty high pressure here uh, near Decatur, Michigan on a sandy soil. Um, so we've got a number of different things going on in this particular field, a lot of variety screening and, and working with the soybean breeder, Di Chun Wang, um, and then screening of varieties, commercially available varieties. And then we also have um, seed treatment trials in here to look at different seed treatments, those that have been around for a little while now, like Olivo, and newer ones such as Saltro. In terms of identifying soybean sudden death syndrome, there's a few features that we're looking for, obviously. The most noticeable of those is the intervenal uh, chlorosis or yellowing and necrosis, which is the death of the tissue between the veins. It's pretty distinct. However, there are a number of other diseases that can be confused with soybean sudden death syndrome, such as brown stem rot. So it's important to also pull up roots and or pull up plants and split stems to see what we have. We split those stems. Um, and it's brown stem rot, then we will see a browning of the stem tissue. Very often we will also see some uh, blue masses of spores on the root system. These ones here today are probably still a little bit young perhaps to see that, but at certain times or towards the end of the season we'll start to see those blue masses of spores starting to form um, on those root systems. Here today we can also see a number of um, soybean cyst nematode eggs on the roots. And those eggs are the smaller of the... Um, Sometimes when we have to do there. our ratings here for soybean sudden death syndrome, we've got to open the canopy a little bit and look for symptoms a little bit further down in the foliage. Um, sometimes plants can outgrow some of the symptoms, so some of those newer leaves may not have any symptoms, but if you look down into, inside the foliage here, we'll see the soybean sudden death syndrome on the leaves. All right, so I mean, that just gives you a quick sort of feel for um, how our trials look down at Decatur there. Um, we've got a, a lot of different work that we've done on SES over the years. Now I'll just sort of jump through to sort of management because I think we're probably close to being out of time. But uh, in terms of managing SES or any disease for that matter, you know, it's really important to know what you're dealing with, right? Um, we've had questions this year trying to identify phytophthora root rot. Right? Um, and SDS and there's been some confusion. So if you're at all uncertain, it is important to figure that out, right? So send a sample into the plant and pest uh, diagnostic clinic, um, get it confirmed so you know, you know how to manage that particular problem. Um, pretty much any disease we're trying to deal with too, using resistant varieties or, or partially resistant varieties or tolerant varieties is really one of the first go-to tools. Uh, for SDS, we've got a couple of the seed treatments, as I mentioned, like Elevo um, or this newer one, Saltro, um, that have similar efficacy, I'd say, at this point in time, uh, based on our testing. Uh, and SDS, always test and manage for a soybean cyst nematode because that can actually exacerbate SDS. And SEN are also going to rob yield too. Uh, and the other sort of interesting thing, again, and this sort of comes back to that discussion in respect to charcoal rot, is extended crop rotations do seem to help with SDS management. And so what I mean by that is not just a, a corn soy rotation, but extending that, having something else in that ro rotation, be it, be it red clover or alpha alpha or something like that. We've seen that to provide some benefit. And so now the real question is, in, economically, perhaps we can't get away from corn and soy as a rotation, but can we use cover crops in there to help sort of diversify uh, the plants that have been growing in that in those fields to help uh, manage diseases. So that's kind of where we're at uh, on SDS and, and some of the thoughts behind um, cover crops. Uh, Mike, how are we doing on time? Marty, we're, we're, about, we're out of time. That's fine. Um, I'll leave it at that then, but we'd be really happy to take any questions. Um, we've got a lot of data on, um, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of different things. I would point you to the Crop Protection Network, and I'll put that up in the box. Um, so if you Google cropprotectionnetwork.org, we've 
been putting a lot of extension information up there, not just from MSU, but a whole bunch of um, land grant universities working together. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Marty. You can see a lot of excellent work being done there at the pathology lab, plant pathology lab. Um, and there is a couple of questions in the, in the question and answer box, and I would encourage you to keep asking questions in that box, and we will address those at 9.30, well, maybe 9.35 now, something like that. So continue to type your questions in there, and we will get those answered. Um, we already had a question regarding uh, Dr. Chris Stefanzo's presentation on foliar defoliators, and uh, so I would like to just go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Chris Stefanzo and have her share her, her presentation. Well, good morning, everybody. Today we're gonna to talk about soybean defoliation. This time of the year, the defoliators in Michigan fields include bean leaf beetles, which make little round holes in the leaves, Japanese beetles, which get together often on the field edges and kind of skeletonize leaves. This year we've had a lot of grasshoppers. They're messy feeders that leave big holes. And sometimes we have uh, some of the caterpillars that web up plants and feed as well. Our defoliation threshold is 30% in vegetative stage beans and 20% in our staged beans like we have right now. And that is an overall defoliation estimate. The defoliation thresholds seem high, but they're high because of the extra capacity that we have in soybeans. If you look at the top of the canopy, that's where most of the photosynthesis is taking place in the bright sunlight. You stick your head under the canopy, you see it's, it's dark. And when there's defoliation along the top of the canopy, that simply lets light down onto those lower leaves that are, for the most part, shaded otherwise. So there, it's like a factory that has extra capacity. Now, significant soybean defoliation can occur. It's much more common in the southern United States. This is a picture that a colleague sent a few years ago, and this is green clover worm. And you can see this is a really bad field, but uh, there would be more of these sorts of pests in the southern US. I had to really work hard to find a picture of defoliation like that in Michigan. This is from 2010, and it's a webworm infestation. You can see that, that there were a lot of weeds in this, um, in this field that were then uh, sprayed with Roundup, and you, then the, the webworms presumably moved on to the soybean and they defoliated. And this is like the only picture that I could find that I had in my uh, computer to show this in Michigan. It's extremely rare to have this level of defoliation. But every year, in late July into August, I get questions from growers, you know, should they be spraying for defoliators? Uh, they read something, they heard something, and there's sort of a persistent um, uh, thought that somehow people should be getting out there and spraying to prevent defoliation. But unnecessary sprays uh, were pretty bad because they kill beneficial insects, insects like ladybugs that would in fact eat other insects like aphids. They could flare spider mites and create a bigger problem. They can select for resistance. We know that there's soybean aphid resistance, for instance, in parts of the western corn belt that we don't want here. You can risk a honeybee kill late in the season if the bees are working your beans, and it's just money out of your pocket. So people will see a, a, a picture like this on the edge of a, a, of a field, this is very dramatic, lots of defoliation here, and the question is, boy, is it over threshold? Unfortunately, when we talk about defoliation, these are often the pictures that we show you, and I'm just as guilty of this as anybody. But we show individual leaflets with uh, chunks taken out, and we give you the percentages. And of course, this 50% looks very reminiscent of the previous slide. And if you saw this picture, you would think, holy cow, I'm over threshold. And I wish that we could just explode th this picture and get rid of it and talk about defoliation in a different way. So here's a plant that I picked from the edge of a field. You can see the top of it has some Japanese beetle uh, feeding. And if we just uh, concentrate on the leaves, we can again see what each individual leaf looks like. If we were going to estimate defoliation of this, uh, what I did was I had a volunteer, a student, take those, these pictures and come up with a defoliation estimate for every leaflet. She looked at the 30 leaflets and she rated them very quickly just as if she was in the field. So if you look at the top of the plant where a lot of dramatic defoliation uh, usually sits as far as bean leaf beetle and Japanese beetle, 
these are the estimates that were given, and they're pretty high. And if we count up all of the leaflets, there's nine leaflets here, if we add up her ratings and then take an average, her average was 34% defoliation, which would be over threshold, right? And we'd be very concerned. But remember, the defoliation thresholds are not based on the, really the top of the plant. It's an overall estimate. So if we take all of her estimates from the bottom of the plant up to the top and we redo the calculation, now we have 30 leaflets and we take an average defoliation of those 30 leaflets. Now we're down to 12% defoliation. So we've already corrected this overly high estimate from the top of the plant down to 12%, which is much more realistic. Any of the light that is filtering through these top leaves, that light is being captured by bottom leaves. Well, the human eye has a bad way of looking at defoliation, defoliated leaves, and overestimating what defoliation is there. We like to like dra dramatize it and, our, and, and make it more than it really is. So to correct that, one of the things you can do is get a little phone app. This is a free phone app called BioLeaf. You don't have to use this one, but this is one that entomologists have been using the last few years in soybean. You take a picture of a leaf against the sky or maybe against a white piece of paper and the bio and you load it into the bio leaf on on your phone the app and it creates a black and white image and then it actually calculates for you the percent defoliation the percent of area removed in this case this leaf here which was green in the black and white image has about 11 percent defoliation so i went back uh, to this plant that the student had already rated. And remember, we've corrected it from 34% to 12%. And I took a, my BioLeaf app and I did all of the leaflets. And the correction is now down to 7%. So when BioLeaf looked at all 30 leaflets and calculated it, again, we've dropped our defoliation even lower. But let's be realistic. We are not going to walk through a field and pluck entire plants like this, rate all the leaflets, that's not reasonable, right? We're not going to do that. Well, what entomologists recommend that you doing is do is that you scout uh, a subsample from the plant to get a snapshot of the average. Of course, you're not going to sample uh, 30 leaflets. But we do encourage you to pick a top, a mid, and a bottom leaf. And for each of those, you throw out the leaflets with the highest and the lowest feeding, and then you rate the three remaining leaflets and take an average. And this is sort of a compromise scouting uh, that takes an average of an average to give you a, a, a very quick snapshot of that point of the field. So let's go back to my plant, my trusty plant, and let's say I was walking through the field and I grab a top leaf I reach my arm into the canopy and I grab a middle leaf. I don't look, I just grab. And then I take one from the bottom of the plant. So now I've kind of, uh, I've accounted uh, for top, mid, and bottom. I take those three leaflets or those, those three leaves and I take out or remove from the estimate the, leaf, the, the leaflet with the highest amount of defoliation the, and the one with the lowest. And I'm doing this by eye. I'm not rating them yet. I'm just casting out the one with too much and the one with too little, sort of like Goldilocks and the three bears. You want to get what's just right. So in this case, I'm keeping just the leaflet that is kind of in the middle of that defoliation. And this was the bio leaf estimate for this leaflet, 25%. This one's 3%, this one's 1%, one, 1%. Then what I do is I take the average of the three leaflets, the top, the mid, the bottom. My estimate here ends up being 10% defoliation. Now 10% is a little bit higher than the bio leaf correction, but it's pretty good. It's capturing right in the middle just about between the whole plant estimate that the student came up with, which is 12% by her eye, and the whole plant estimate I came up with from the fancy app. So by instead of rating 30 whole uh, leaflets, we, we were able to generate a close enough estimate just by grabbing a subsample of three leaflets from the top, mid, and bottom. And you would do this in a pattern around the field. You wouldn't 
you know, walk along the edge of the, of, of the field. You'd walk maybe down three or four rows, kind of go back and forth. Usually 40 plants in a field is enough to tell what's, what's going on. And when you do this sort of scouting, you're just not looking for defoliation, but it gives you some idea of how many beneficials are out there. Are there any other pests out there at that time of the year, like stink bug? You know, are there any other things going on, like disease, white mold, for instance? So entomologists the last year have actually uh, done this across many fields in multiple states as part of an NCSRP funded study. And most of our fields, when we scout the whole field using the subsample method, have less than 1% defoliation. The highest average I had in Michigan was 3.5%. That was actually at Saginaw Valley for last, for last year. So you can see that most fields have almost no defoliation. So my summary points here are that 99.9% .9 of Michigan fields are well below thresholds for defoliation by insects. I'm not counting deer and woodchucks and such, by insects, because soybean has so much capacity to tolerate defoliation. And don't estimate defoliation on the edge of the field by looking at the top of the plant and looking at that dramatic damage by Japanese beetle, for instance. Get into the field, use a quick subsample, and the subsampling doesn't have to be hard. You can improve uh, your eye uh, by practice and by using a phone app. And it makes defoliation actually in the end not too hard to scout for. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, there's an address here to email me if you want to be on my e email list. Thanks. Chris, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation and uh, a very timely topic because uh, we do, we see uh, soybean defoliation every year. Um, there was a question in there, but I think you answered it about Japanese beetles. Yep. Um, that raises a question and I think what we'll probably do is we'll probably, some of these questions that were where the answers were provided in writing, I think I still might revisit those during the 930 time slot. Mm -hmm. So just so everyone has a chance to see the question and the answers. So um, we'll see how time proceeds. With that, I'm going to introduce our next speakers, uh, Dr. Kurt Steinke and Christian uh, Twilliger, and uh, they're going to be giving us a soil fertility or plant nutrition update. Good morning, I'm Kurt Steinke. Today we would like to talk a little bit about some of the soybean research we've been uh, looking at over the last couple of years. One of the key interests that soybean producers continue to express their interest in is building more resilience into their production systems. Now one area of focus to build a little bit more resiliency, and when we talk about resiliency, we're talking about more short-term resiliency within a growing season is looking at how they can adjust their nutrient management practices to better capture and utilize nutrients to maintain that longer term nutrient availability later in the season and hopefully result in a potential yield response. Now the study we're looking at here this morning, there's two areas of focus and these two areas are questions that we often get from soybean producers year to year. One question is, should they use a starter fertilizer? at planting time. And the second area of focus tends to be, what can I do in season when my soil test phosphorus and soil test potassium levels are already above critical concentrations? Thanks, Kurt, for the introduction. As Kurt mentioned, my name is Christian Twilliger, and I am a second year graduate research assistant in the Soil Fertility and Nutrient Management Program. So what we're looking at is to improve nutrient uptake in irrigated and non-irrigated soybean production systems. And to do that, we have three different seeding rates, 60,000, 120,000, and 180,000 seeds per acre, and five different fertilizer treatments, which include a check with no fertilizer, the second being 150 pounds of microessential sulfur zinc in a two by two at planting, the third, a liquid potash application at 16 gallons per acre near V6, the fourth, a 10340 applications at 15 gallons per acre near R1, and a fifth is a combination of the three fertilizer treatments, which is the MES, the liquid potash application, and the 10340 application. What we're looking at here are soybeans that received the four different fertilizer treatments, the MES, the 
liquid potash, the 10340 in combination, and then behind is a plot that received only the 10340 application. And as you can notice, there is a size difference between the two plots, and there is canopy closure with the all fertilizer treatment plot. So what we're looking at here is an example of two soybean plants that are planted at the same population. Now, if you had to ask a lot of people, which plant would you prefer, the plant on the left or the plant on the right, many would probably say the plant on the right. However, a couple questions that we have to answer before we recommend a specific nutrient management practice. And these include, what are the nutrients that we apply in season to the plant doing to the plant? And where are those nutrients going in the plant? So in the end, we need to remember, can we make better use of our fertilizer and at the same time, increase our profitability? In addition, we also found that leaf size and petiole length is greater when a starter fertilizer is applied. And that can be seen in the right plant where the mez was applied and not in the left plant where there was no fertilizer. And with this expanded leaf area and quicker canopy closure, the result may be the greater influence of photosynthetic capacity or capturing of light to produce sugars of the mes plant on the right, which may be greater than that of the control plant on the left. Here we have two uppermost trifoliates, the left being a trifoliate from the non-fertilized or the Czech plant, and the right being a trifoliate from the mes or uh, two by two plant. And so as you can see, there is a growth in stem or petiole, as well as larger leaves or a trifolia in the mes plant. And so what we wanna be sure is that we're not just feeling this growth and having that not translate into yield. So here we have 120,000 seeding rate. And on the left is a plant from the check plot. And to the right is a plant from the mes plot. And as you can see, like the 60,000, there is a biomass response. And so with that biomass response, it's not as great as would be the 60,000 because of greater interplant competition in the 120,000 seeds per acre seeding rate. Just like the 60K and 120K, the 180,000 seeds per acre produced a similar bioresponse. So on the left, we have a plant from the non-fertilized or check plot and a plant on the right has mes and a two by two. And again, as we increase seeding rate, there's more interplant competition, so we see less of a biomass response. However, plant morphology changes, as I mentioned before with the interplant competition, is you can see the plant grow taller and it obviously has less leaves as well. What we're looking at here are five plants from the five different fertilizer treatments. The first plant to the left is a plant from the control plot. The second plant to the left is a plant from the mes at planting with a two by two. The third from the left is a plant that had liquid potash. And the second plant to the right would be a plant that had 10-34-0. And the last plant is a combination of all the fertilizer treatments as I just described. To wrap up, if you wanna know anything or other related information about soy related projects, please visit soils.msu.edu and thanks for watching. All right, uh, good morning everybody. A uh, couple things we wanted to, to continue to cover based on that video. So we shot that video, oh, about three or four weeks ago. Um, so we wanted to update that a little bit. Uh, most of our beans now are sitting around uh, our six. So we shot some footage in the field uh, last uh, Thursday and Friday. So to cover a few basics of what Christian uh, went over there, you know, in general, when you look at soybeans today, we know they produce much more biomass than they did uh, a decade or two ago. We also know they're subject to many more variations in climate. You know, so you look at these spring seasons that we've planted into over the last, uh, you know, even five years or so. You know, you're looking at planting dates that may vary from anywhere from, you know, about a six to eight week period, you know, mid-June all the way back up to, to about early April. 
And so it's a very different climate, and very different soil conditions that you plan into, let's say the last week in April versus the last week in May. So your nutrient response will be a little bit different based on that uh, in and of itself. One of the other things uh, that, that we always talk about is soybeans can be very frustrating from a nutrient perspective, especially when your soil test phosphorus and potassium levels are above critical because a lot of times they may not respond to additional applications uh, uh, unless you're in more of a high yield environment. So what Christian and I were looking at there, again, we'll, we'll uh, uh, reiterate three populations looking at 60, 120, and 180,000 plants to the acre, all in 30 inch rows. And we kind of have an irrigated and a non-irrigated component. So that irrigated component, we're really trying to push that high yield potential. When I say high yield, we're talking 75 bushels and greater. Uh, that environment has a higher soil test phosphorus level, um, also has a higher soil test potassium level. And that non-irrigated site is much more of a lower or marginal field as we would uh, refer to. So it's non-irrigated, has a near critical soil test phosphorus level and a uh, below critical soil test potassium level. So the treatments that he was really looking at there were a check plot where we just plant and do nothing else. We have our starter applied two by two, which is a 1240 10 one at 150 pounds to the acre. Now, why did we choose that rate? Well, it keeps the N content less than 20 pounds to the acre. And that's usually the threshold that we've seen over the last several years that when we get above 20 units, nodulation tends to get reduced. When we stay below 20 units, we tend to not see major changes in nodulation. We also looked at liquid potash uh, at about 53 pounds of K2O applied at V6 uh, with a wide drop applicator. Uh, why did we choose uh, that timing? Again, potassium uptake tends to peak around that time. 1034O at about 15 gallons to the acre, which is about 17 units of N, or about 59 units of P2O5. Apply to R1, again, with a wide drop applicator. Why did we choose that timing? FOS uptake tends to peak during that uh, time period also. And we also know that when you get into this time of year, you start looking at R5, R5 and a half beans and later, a lot of the late season nutrient uptake tends to occur from the soil, not necessarily just uh, remobilization within the plant. Now the fifth treatment we had there was a combination of everything, the two by two, the liquid potash, and the 1034O applied at R1. Uh, so here's a picture we took uh, late last week. Again, looking at, uh, this is the 60,000 population irrigated at R6. So from left to right, you can see the treatments are uh, check plot doing nothing, the second treatment, that the arrow's on uh, right here uh, would be the two by two applied uh, MES product. The next one would be the liquid potash product applied at V6. The next one would be the 1034O applied at R1. And the last one would be the combination treatment with all of the above. Big thing to notice here when we go through the next couple of slides is look at the size of the plants, one, compared to the measuring stick that we see here. You can also see within this slide how some of that morphology changes over time. So when you look at 2020, this specific uh, field was planted on May 9th. All right, so about uh, three to four weeks earlier than we got this in last year. So we had a much longer period of vegetative growth. So when you look at that two by two application, we had a much longer period to support some of that additional vegetative growth early in the season. So keep this picture in your head a little bit and I'll change slides here. Looking at this is our 60,000 non-irrigated at R6. So I'll go back one, look at the size of those plants compared to that yardstick in the center versus this one, much smaller, about 50% less overall size uh, with regards to the plant height, not necessarily biomass. And again, left to right, we see our check plot on the left. We see our uh, two by two starter. In the center, we have our liquid potash. Uh, second from the right, our 1034O. And immediately all the way to the right would be the combination treatment. So again, we're seeing some of those changes in morphology. And specifically at this population, you can kind of see the bushes or that bush-like morphology that forms within that soybean plant. We jump to 120,000 population irrigated at R6. First thing that sticks out is, uh, wow, what a difference in uh, shape these plants take. So you increase that plant to plant competition and those plants tend to shoot up a little bit more than out, all right, to try to reach that additional sunlight. 
Uh, same thing here, take a look at that yardstick where we're at. And then again, check plot on the far left, that two by two starter, second from the left, that liquid potash in the middle, that 10340 to the right, and that combination treatment all the way uh, on the right. So again, you can see a little bit difference in plant height, morphology. Compare that again with the 120,000 non-irrigated at R6, same differences showing up. Uh, so we see a little bit of a difference, you know, again, whether you're irrigated, non-irrigated, and again, that, that specific nutrient response will differ whether you're in that more of that high yield environment where water tends not to be a limiting factor. So you can take up a lot of those nutrients or whether water is a limiting factor in this non-irrigated environment. And the last one we'll show here is 180,000 irrigated R6, you really notice that, again, that, that more spindly uh, growth habit of that plant. Um, again, 180,000, check plot, uh, two by two applied starter, second from the left, liquid potash, 10340, and that combination treatment all the way to the right. We see a much uh, less uh, biomass response from that combination treatment um, at that higher population. And again, uh, 180,000 non-irrigated, you can see how those plants look. Again, notice the overall size and how those plants tend to be a little bushier with that combination treatment with the non-irrigated, but we didn't necessarily see that same response with that irrigated treatment. Couple slides uh, before I wrap up. I uh, wanted to do a little bit side-by-side uh, -side comparisons. We did some pod counts last week. So again, uh, plant on the left is looking at that irrigated check versus irrigated with that two by two starter on the right. Again, this is at R6. Uh, when you look at uh, size difference, obviously you can see that from the photo. Pod difference wasn't necessarily the, the, the uh, case though. So the plant on the left, that check plot, had about 185 pods to that plant. Plant on the right had 148 pods. Now, thing we gotta remember is that pod counts may not directly translate to yield potential because I can tell you, uh, with that starter uh, applied two by two on the right, those pods were significantly bigger and individual uh, grain uh, was larger uh, in that plant on the right than the plant on the left. So you can't necessarily just rely on pod counts as an indicator of yield potential. At 120,000 population, again, check on the left versus two by two on the right. We had about 72 pods versus 78 pods with the plant on the right and again, we noticed there was a size difference in the actual pods. Some had three and four uh, grains per pod versus that uh, check plot did not, it was more two or three. And that 180,000 irrigated check on the left versus two by two on the right, we see much less of a change in morphology. Again, a little more biomass, you can tell by the plant as compared to that yardstick. And again, it was a, a dead even heat, 61 pods per plant total for each plant. So we'll wrap it up there. I uh, want to thank Michigan Soy uh, for uh, funding some of this work. This was a multi-year study. Um, we'll be around to answer any more questions and uh, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Kurt. And I would encourage you to uh, type your questions into the Q&A box and we will get those addressed at the, at the, after our last presentation. And that would be for any of our speakers that were um, presentations that were given today. Our last speakers for the day are Dr. Marcel Quintanella and uh, Brian Levine, and they're going to update us on managing soybean cyst nematodes. My name is Marisol Quintanella, and I'm the applied nematologist from Michigan State University. Um, my lab has um, eight other members. My technician, Brian, has been the one that has done most of the soybean work and um, CETA, that done the cover crop work. Soybean cyst nematode is the biggest yield robber of soybeans, the big, biggest yield robbing pathogen in North America. That means this is a very important pest, a very important nematode. And once it's established in your field, it is very it's very difficult, nearly impossible to get rid of. You can have a field and not plant soybeans for 10 years. And even after that, 
When you plant soybeans again, they will hatch out of the cyst and infest your soybeans. So this is, that leads us to the very important point that trying to prevent from getting soybean cyst nematode should be your number one priority. So if you don't have it, try to not get it. How do you not get it? Try to make sure to use clean machinery when you move from an infested field to a clean field, wash, etc. Sample your fields in order to know whether you have it or not, and if you do have it, there, if you do have soybean system at those, there are some things that you can do. There we, we've been doing some trials. And one of the number one things that you can do to manage soybean cyst nematode is to plant resistant varieties. Fortunately, there is now more than one source of resistance. The most common source of resistance is P888 that has been used for about the last 20 years consistently in many soybean fields, I would say mainly most soybean fields. And what has happened is that soybean cyst nematode is developing resistant to P8878. In other words, it is breaking the resistance. Kind of similar, like using the same herbicide on the wheat for 20 years, what happens? Your wheat's no longer die with that herbicide. Same, same concept. Well, there's another source of resistance called Peking. And on the first year, when you first use Peking, you get a big yield boost because it's a different source of resistance and nematodes are not used to it. So it's a good strategy to rotate P8878 with Pekin, which are mainly the only two commercial um, uh, sources of resistance available. So our trials have shown that rotating Pekin with P8878 is the most effective. If you if, if we have tried planting Peking back to back, and after you plant Peking for three years in a row, what happens is that you do see a yield decline. So we do not recommend growers to switch from PI-878 to Peking because they'll have a yield decrease. We recommend them to rotate. On the years that they grow soybeans, Sometimes they can use a P8878 source of resistance and sometimes a Peking source of resistance. Now moving to other strategies to manage nematode. There's also seed treatment. We have found in our trials about a two bushel yield bump with a Levo and BioST. Um, that is not a big yield bump, but it is there. And we have found some significant difference on that. Um, we also have found that manure, such as chicken manure, applied in the corn year, has some decrease um, in soybean cyst nematode numbers, but the decrease is modest. It is not going to eliminate them, but it does help a bit. Um, another thing that is very exciting and new and that we're working, especially with Dr. George Bird, is a trap crop. A trap crop, it's a, it, it, it is a plant similar to soybeans, that the nematodes go inside the soybeans, inside the roots, and start feeding, but they are not able to reproduce. And our trials are showing very good success in this, and it is very effective in reducing soybean cyst nematode numbers, causing cysts to hatch. Nematodes are going inside the root, but they are not able to reproduce, so their numbers are crashing. So soybean cyst nematode is an important nematode, and I want to reiterate one of the most, the most important management practices, prevent from getting it. Also, rotate with non-host, things like so, um, corn, wheat, pretty much anything that is not soybean. Um, rotate resistant varieties. P8878 with Peking, if you do have it, rotate. Do not switch to Peking and only use Peking. Peking is a great tool to increase yield, but it breaks down if you use it many years in a row. So rotate a Peking source of resistance with a P8878 source of resistance. There's other exciting things like manures, um, seed treatments, and the most exciting thing right now for us is that trap crop that we are evaluating further. Um, mainly, this is Dr. George Bird's um, idea, and the results are 
are, are very exciting so far, showing that this trap crop lets the nematodes go in and feed and grow but not reproduce, so it's lowering down the numbers, trapping them from the field. And so I would recommend you to send, the most important thing is send samples from your field to the plant diagnostic lab at Michigan State University. This is covered by the Michigan Soybean Promotion Committee by the soybean checkoff dollars. Sample and um, do a randomized, I mean, do a, do a sample like in a V shape or zigzag in your field and submit it to the, the plant diagnostic lab. And also ask to check what source, um, what SCN type do you have? What soybean systematode type? In other words, can that SCN feed successfully, reproduce successfully in P8878 or Peking, or is it well controlled by both? That can help you make smarter management decisions. So I wish, I wish you the best and best success of, um, of growth this year for, and yields for soybean. Excellent presentation, Marisol. Do you also, do you and Brian have uh, any further presentation that you'd like to do with slides or does that wrap up your talk? Yes, I, I, have, a, <clears throat> I have a couple more things to, to, to present. Very good. Okay, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. So, oh, I, I shared the wrong one, sorry. Um, um, all right, so um, just wanted to point out a couple of things. I, I know I'm, I, hit, um, I hit most of the important um, points in the video. I um, wanted to show you with my team my um, wonderful nematology team with um, students and uh, postdocs. <clears throat> I wanted to show a pretty striking, some pretty striking pictures showing the importance of rotating picking with PI8788. On the screen, you can see actually the um, plot design for our rotation of PI8788, picking and susceptible in multiple years and um, we are even doing it now so we have done it consecutively for four years we can see um, it, the options are p8878 back to back peking back to back p8878 rotated with peking and also susceptible uh, um, some some rotations have susceptible on the first year in 2017, when we first started, we see that the yields are even. And even our nematode numbers, we started even, which was um, a good news for us. The nematode um, pressure was low and Peking and PI8788 showed same yields, no significant difference and numerically also really same. Something really happened after that. After rotating Peking, after, rota after, after this um, trial was two years in a row. In other words, we had Peking back to back for two years, or PI 788 back to back for, for two years, or one year of rotation. We started seeing very big differences. Peking and PI 878 rotated we had the highest yield. And this matches the results of Greg Tilka in Iowa. He's done huge trials on multiple farms in which he plants Peking and uh, or PI8788, and he sees a very big yield bump when growers switch to Peking. And this was what happened. We plant PI8788, and the second year we grew Peking, and we see a very big um, yield bump is the highest 
yield um, higher than PI 878 back to back. But what happens when we go picking for two years in a row? We already see in a decrease in yield. Um, the susceptible obviously has the lowest yield. And if we see the nematode numbers, the nematode numbers perfectly correlate with yield. The lower the SCN numbers, the higher the yield. The PI 878 and Peking had the highest, um, had the lowest nematode numbers and the highest yield as you see in the graph um, there. So it's a perfectly inverse relationship. Um, um, high nematode numbers, lower yield, or inversely, um, low nematode numbers, high yields. So Peking back-to-back -back did increase nematode numbers. When we did this on the third year in a row, in other words, last season in 2019, we can see the same trend happening. PI 8788, Peking, and PI, you know, PI 8788 rotation. You know, in other words, we are rotating in between the two. We had the highest yield. This is consistent. Uh, PI 8788 back to back, we had the second highest. And when we planned three years of Peking, we again had the lowest yield, but this time even lower than where we had planned is susceptible. So the moral of the story is here, the best strategy is to rotate. We need to rotate PI 788 with Peking, not replace with Peking, because Peking does provide the biggest yield on the first year that you planted. People might think of switching, of thinking, oh, Peking gave me the biggest yield, this is consistent in Iowa also. First year, first year when you switch, it gives you a very big yield. Therefore, you might switch permanently. And this is not a good choice because if you permanently switch, you get a real reduction. We actually want to rotate. I mean, we, we need to rotate. It is the, big, the best strategy. Um, and uh, I wanted to point out what are the best management strategies. Um, the best managers, managers, manage, manage, management strategies for soybean cyst nematode is rotating with non-hosts such as corn or wheat or pretty much anything that is not soybean um, with a couple of exceptions. Rotating sources of resistance such as PI 878 with Peking. And fortunately, there are new sources of resistance coming. I have had companies contact me saying that they have new sources of resistance coming. So now if we have another source of resistance that we can include in the rotation, it would, we would even get better soybean cyst nematode um, management strategy. And also we will get better sustainability. In other words, we will preserve, like PI 878 has been a very good tool and we'll be able to preserve it. The nematodes will not able to be able to break the resistance if we include other um, resistance, um, sources of resistance in the rotation. Seed treatments, we have tested some. They do provide, some of them do provide some protection, but that protection seems to be moderate. Um, and of course, the best thing is sanitation. If you don't have it in your field, try to keep it away. So clean your equipment and testing. For testing, you can send soils to plant diagnostic lab and they are covered by soybean checkoff dollars. Compost and manures, we're finding good results with chicken manure, um, especially when applied in the year of corn. And we have exciting results with um, some trap crop uh, that actually is removing soybean cyst nematodes from the soil, making the cyst to hatch and going into the plant, but not allowing them to reproduce. So actually lowering the field numbers. And um, this is actually work from Dr. George Bird. And the results are very exciting so far. And we have trials on this, and hopefully this will be available to growers in the future. All right, so I wanna thank all our 
are of help and Michigan soybean promotion number one because they provided most of the funding. So thank you and that's it. Thank you, Mike, for organizing this and doing a great job. Thank you, Marisol. Very good information on the number one soybean pest. And uh, Marisol, I think if uh, there was a couple of questions that came up, so this is a chance for us to maybe just transition now into our open question and answer period. This will be any question is fair game for our presenters. Um, and this is your opportunity to do that. We're scheduled to go until 10 o'clock. I've checked with our presenters and if there's just a lot of questions, we can go a little bit over time. But uh, I'm gonna jump right into some of the nematode ones because uh, they're fresh. Um, one of the first ones was, um, do you still see a yield reduction with using Peking varieties in a corn soybean rotation? Um, yes, because I mean, uh, you, I mean, is the question is do we see still see a yield pump when we in, include Peking? Can can you read I the question again? Yeah, I think it's actually a yield uh, reduction. Um, okay, so the the answer the answer is when um when in Iowa State University, Greg Telka did a trial with Peking, and when he planted Peking in the first year, most of these have a corn, um, a soybean and corn rotation. They saw a major yield increase when they used Peking. When you use corn and you still plant Peking back to back, but this time the, that instead of the yield decrease that I found that I found in three in two years, it might take you four years because you're planting corn in between. So, but that will happen because even when you plant corn, you will still have those soybean cyst nematodes in the soil that started developing resistance to the previous soybean crop. So instead of you um, getting that yield decrease in two years, it'll take you four. Instead of uh, it looking worse than the susceptible, instead of that happening in three years, it will take you six but it'll happen anyway because you still have the same nematodes in the field nothing is happening with them in the corn they're not changing um uh, the the essien type it, it is just one year that there's no there's a non-host therefore populations decline but they don't change ACN type so yes that yield decrease will still happen if you plant peking back to back um uh, four years in a row, in, in other words, you plant it two years in a row, but you plant corn in between, so that would be four years. Does that make sense? It'll still happen, but instead of happening in two, it'll happen in four. Very yes. good. Very good, Marisol. That, I think, answers the question. Um, along those same lines, um, we've heard in the past that uh, if you can't, if you want to stay with a PI88 um, source of resistance, that there's a benefit to rotating varieties that have that resistance. It's not as good as switching to Peking, but it's better than staying with the exact same variety each time you plant soybeans. Is there truth yes. to that or? Oh, there's some truth to that because PI8788 sources of resistance are not monolithic. They're not all the same. Um, they'll have like different number of copies of that gene that grants resistance. So you you know like the strength of the resistance repent, depends kind of like on the number of copies of that same gene. So every uh, maybe every variety will have will be a little bit different, but it'll be it will be very similar in the sense that it's the same gene, just different copies of the gene. So if you really want to throw if you really want to uh, do a number on the nematodes, you use a totally different source of resistance or a totally different strategy so that they can't adapt very quickly. So using a different variety can help a bit, but using a totally different source of resistance really throws them a monkey wrench. I mean, really it makes them, um, uh, really gives them a harder time, which, is, which gives you a bigger, big yield bump. Good. Marcel, there's one final question, and actually it was asked three times, so we do need to address this. Must be important. Basically, what are the 
the trap crops that are effective for soy for SEN. Okay. Well, there's only one so far that we found, and this is Dr. Bird's um, project. And I don't think I'm allowed to surrender the secret until it's kind of released. Um, uh, but if it helps, it is a legume. And it's only one type so far. And the secret, it, all other cover crops, many other cover crops, work very well as non-hosts. In other words, they won't reproduce in, soy, in, in those cover crops, let's say with um, many radishes or oil seed radishes. But this is special because it'll make nematodes, you know, the cyst, hatch, go inside this plant, start feeding, and they will not be able to grow up, I mean, keep on developing and reproduce. And my postdoc has pictures of this, of the nematodes going inside the root and not developing into females. They do some of them develop into males, but they no females reproduce. In other words, no increase in numbers. So it's like the problem with soybean cyst nematode, it can last for like decades in the same soil, even if you don't plant soybeans. But with this, you could plant this and make them hatch. So kind of reduce that that bank, that seed, that that nematode bank, you know, that that they're um, that that is safe for the future, you know, you know. Very good, very good, yeah. Marcel. We sure appreciate it. Uh, those were some really good answers to some really good questions. Um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to revisit a few of the questions that were answered in writing because some some folks joined us by phone. Um, and, and that. So I want to revisit a few of these. Um, there was one for Chris DeFonzo. I have Japanese beetles chewing on the top leaves of my soybeans, but I'm reluctant to spray as I also have ladybugs, which eat aphids. Any suggestions? Well, Chris got back with, uh, with uh, the, the questioner and basically said it's, it's too late to spray um, and the defoliation thresholds are very high at this time. Also, Japanese beetles life cycle is ending. And the other thing about that is Chris's presentation probably answered the question pretty fully. It's an excellent presentation on assessing defoliation. Um, there was another question about dual for Christy, and I think Christy answered this, but do you recommend applying dual pre-emergence or post-emergence in soybeans? And Christy's answer is a little bit long. It was, uh, Christy, actually, I'm going to let you answer that uh, orally. Thanks, Mike. Um, it, a lot of it really depends on what the goals for that application of dual are. If you're trying to look at it for water hemp control, we usually recommend trying to put that in as with your post-emergence application to get you some longer residual control of um, some of those later emerging water hemp. So that's one place that you might want to use it post-emergence. Um, like I said, it, it is effective pre-emergence. It really depends on what your goal is for the, uh, the application. Very good. Thank you, Christy. Here's another question um, from a producer and it's for Marty. It says, has there been any research done to identify certain soil physical properties such as pH or texture or fertility practices, such as applied nitrogen or other nutrients lead to higher incidences of white mold? Marty? Hey, yep, I'm um, sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah, essentially, what we tend to see is that um, under higher uh, fertility conditions, I guess, more productive ground, we tend to get uh, greater white mold. Um, and so what's happening there is that we get earlier canopy closure. Uh, we may potentially make those plants even a little bit more susceptible to white mold too, but certainly canopy closure is a pretty significant part of that. And we have some work this year actually where we put down different rates of uh, nitrogen. I talked to Kurt about this earlier, um, about, you know, just trying to look at that, put some more numbers to that. But yes, in general, that will uh, be a potential, one of the potential drivers for, for more white mold. And it was a follow-up to that, and I, I, I missed that. The same um, so yeah, there was a question about um, soil texture, um, whether that really had any impact. And no, and we see white mold on sandy soils, heavier soils. It's really more about the environmental conditions. Is it cool and wet 
or you know, are you irrigating? Are you seeding at a really high population rate? Um, all of those sorts of factors really tend to drive it. Um, and, and where you are in the state, right? There's certain areas that um, you know. I think about the thumb as being potentially you know lake effect um, driven weather, and especially close to the lake, and that's that's an area where we see a lot more white mold because of those environmental conditions. So, environment for most diseases is really really important. It's one of the sort of key things that are needed um, to result in uh, significant disease anyway. Marty, there is one more follow-up on regarding white mold and uh, just lengthening out the crop rotation, including more non-host crops. Is that beneficial in reducing white mold? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I was just, I put an answer in there too. So the thing is, uh, again, it comes back to conditions, right? Um, it, it'll certainly help without a doubt, but we've got to remember that even if we're under some sort of, you know, fantastic situation of a four-year crop rotation, you can still get slammed by white mold if conditions are favorable. So what will happen is that those sclerotia, which are the resting body of the fungus, will start to degrade in the soil. But unfortunately, we know that they can survive for up to 10 years. The population will decline, absolutely. But if we get very favorable conditions, um, it doesn't take too many of those sclerotia per you know, square foot to, to get disease rolling. Um, and so, yeah, just like what we had back in 2014, we even had some folk that um, swore that they never had white mold, um, soybeans in those fields previously and they got a lot of white mold. So I think 2014 was really exceptional. We had very, very cool and wet, misty conditions. I think we probably had spore movement from other fields neighboring, which is not particularly common. It, most of the inoculum comes from within field. But yes, crop rotation helps a lot. Marty, there's another one that you answered uh, in writing, but I think it, it warrants uh, an oral response. When using fungicides to prolong greenness, is there a danger of promoting fung fun fungal resistance or fungicide resistance? Yeah, so whenever we spray a fungicide, we are potentially selecting for uh, resistant isolates. Um, so it's very much like the uh, glyphosate and uh, resistance issues we have with weeds now, right? The more we spray, the more we're selecting. So there is definitely some danger to those prophylactic sprays that just put on just because. Um, in my view, I think we really should be using those fungicides primarily for disease control. Um, so there's some danger there. You know, thankfully, I would say though, in field crops, because we're only spraying, you know, once, twice a season, perhaps, the relative risk is relatively low compared to um, other production systems like, you know, apples and vegetables where there's multiple sprays a season. In those situations, we're at much higher risk of developing resistance. And I guess we've probably seen that um, in sugar beets, right? Where we're trying to control uh, sacrosma leaf blight. Uh, we make multiple applications. And because of that, we've seen that resistance develop in that pathosystem, right? So now we've got isolates uh, that are resistant to that strobilurin class of chemistry. And we have seen that for frog eye leaf spot in soybean. I don't believe that's a, a major issue in Michigan, perhaps in the South in some particular situations. Uh, but yeah, we do have strobilurin resistance in that particular uh, fungus or that pathogen now as well. Good, good. Um, there's another question from Marcel, and uh, why aren't there any BT type genes that will handle SCN? I, I forgot to unmute myself. So <laughs> okay, now I unmuted myself. Um, so. It, BT and I, I do not have a, a direct answer in the sense that I have not evaluated BT genes on SCN. SCN is not an insect, so I do not believe that the effect on BT would be the same on um, insects compared to nematodes. Um, it, 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 it might, I do not expect it to have a big impact, but I believe there is some research on this and I, but I have not um, done a big um, digging on, I mean, a lot of research. I have not done any research or personal research on this. It is not the strategy used for um, soybean cyst nematode management. It's more effective on insects. Very good. 
This is Chris here. There is an application to EPA. I think it's by BASF, but I'm not 100% sure. And I think it's a CRY 14. Uh, again, I, I'm not, I don't know how it works in the nematode. It would presumably something that would attack the, the, the gut, but that's, that's very new and, and it's, in a, it's in a testing phase. That's, right, but that's, that's for insects, not for nematodes, right, uh, Chris? No, that is for SCN, I believe. Yeah, Chris, okay, I put an, really cool. an article. I need to look at it. The, there's a link to an article in the chat box. I think that you guys can check out. Excellent. Came, came through? I would think so. Very good. Um, Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisol. There is a, a question for Chris, since you were on, Chris. Is, uh, um, any comments on spider mites this year? So <sighs> spider mites have sort of come and gone. There's, there's uh, fields that have some damage. The pictures that I've been sent, for the most part, uh, the mites were not in the picture and the webbing looked all messed up. So when the mites are there, they keep the webbing up, like fixing the roads, you know, they kind of got to, got to, keep it going. Um, any little bit of humidity under the canopy, the other morning it was 98% humidity, even though it was very dry around campus, it was 98% humidity and there's natural entomopathogens pathogens uh, that can kill nematodes. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about nematodes, kill spider mites. So kind of the sweet spot to spray for mites would probably be that end of July, early August. A lot of, a lot of the miticides, when you read the label, say that you have to spray, at, you know, populations as they're beginning or that they're actively growing or that you have to get the sprays on early. So at this point, it's just too late in the year, really, I think, to get a return on any of those miticides. And then we might be getting into some of the pre, the pre harvest intervals on that. Um, if we would just get a little bit of rain, a little bit of humidity in there, then they will just naturally just kind of decrease and the stage of the soybeans isn't very favorable for them anyway. But it's true. We don't, we don't, I, we don't, in, in the northern tier, we don't see spider mites as often as they do in the south, and we don't do as good of a job understanding that timing and how to manage them as they do in the south where they spray a lot more. Chris, having said that, you have an excellent publication, actually two of them, um, one that lists the miticides, but then another one that helps uh, producers uh, assess the mite damage and make treatment decisions. Could you post either the URLs for those publications in, in the chat, or could you maybe put up a link to your website, whatever you prefer? Just sure, and if, 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 some, if you can just Google it, it's through, it's through MSU and it's like Field Crops Entomology. It's the only website, but I'll, I'll put it into the, into the chat thing as well. That'd be really good. Really appreciate it. Um, there's a new question here is, uh, Marty, this would be for you. Uh, or maybe Manny, um, or maybe me. Uh, any recommendations for optimal combine setup to harvest fields that have high white mold incidence? Mike, why don't you answer that? What are your thoughts? I, I think whenever I've seen bad white mold, it's accompanied with lodging. So we do have some fact sheets on, on, on lodging, and I can, uh, I'm not sure I can post that in the, um, question and answer period while I'm doing this, but we can email that, that link out. But we have information on harvesting lodge soybeans. The other issue, of course, is the sclerotia that are gonna be captured in the grain tank if you have really bad white mold. And, uh, and so you're gonna be docked at the elevator for that. It's, it's gonna be considered as foreign material. So, and it's very difficult to sort out um, in, in size wise. So those would be some of the issues um, those sclerotia probably have some things, well, they're probably not quite as dense, right? But it's, it's just probably hard with sieves and even fan speed to get them blow out the back. Yep, that, that would probably work. Right now, that's all the questions that we have. We've answered every question and I think we visited most of the questions that were asked. Is there any burning questions? If not, I'm going to make an attempt to probably stay on, stay on time and, and, and wrap this up. I don't see any further questions in the in the question and answer. I will mention that this is this uh, has been recorded and it will be available um, to view at a later date. Uh, so let's let's just go ahead and, and wrap it up. First of all, I want to thank all of our presenters. A lot of time and effort went into these presentations. I want to thank Dave Ellis for his excellent uh, 
video work and working with us today. Um, Shelby Warner was instrumental behind the scenes in making things flow smoothly. So really appreciate all those efforts. Um, and then uh, I want to thank you, of course, for, for participating and, uh, and helping us, uh, you know, introduce this new technology of, of virtual field days. So we really appreciate that. The program is worth two uh, pesticide recertification credits, and that's for private core, commercial core, and commercial 1A. And in order to receive the credits, um, Shelby's going to put up a link to a survey. And once you complete that survey, you will get the seminar code and all of the information you need to receive your credits. So that's uh, um, basically all we have for today. Shelby, if you would go ahead and, and put up that last slide or um, on how, how our participants would access the survey. Mike, the survey will actually pop up once they leave the Zoom meeting. It will pop up in their web browser. Perfect. Thank you, Shelby. There is one last question, and uh, it's what are the expected yields for 2020? Well, it depends on who you ask, but the official yield estimate is, is predicted to be a record yield. The latest one I saw was predicted to be 51 bushels uh, in the state of Michigan. In our part of the world, I'm starting to doubt that because of the extensive dry period that we've seen in, in western Michigan, southwestern Michigan. Um, but uh, that's the latest one I've seen is 51 bushels for Michigan. I don't see any other questions. I, I, we're at 10.01. Again, I appreciate your participation and uh, look forward to, uh, to working on some more virtual programs. Thank you.